And this is not only archives of the Schmidt family, but the brewery since 1896, all the records, all the photos. It's thousands of photos and, and papers and, and drawings and, and, and ad campaigns and all kinds of things that is just a, a rich archives and it's job security for Karen, our curator, because it's gonna be a long time of digitizing and organizing and coordinating. And uh, it's, she's been doing a bang up job and she and the, in fact, some of the volunteers are here today helping, helping us out with the archives. And so I'm gonna, we're gonna have kind of a tag team presentation here for you. It's uh, finding the treasures that we've discovered digging through those files the past year, a little over a year actually. And so I'm gonna introduce you to our curator first, Karen Johnson. Thank you. Um, well, Don just told you most of my intro, so. <laughs> we can go home earlier than planned. Uh, yeah, oh no, God no. That bore you all to tears. Um, Okay, there we go. Is that in focus? Um, as Don mentioned, the, um, we have a, a pretty good size archives downstairs, mostly cardboard boxes. Have any of you been on the house tour here with Bob Krim? Quite a few. So you've been down in the basement, and you probably have seen part of our collection, but not, you haven't been into the archives room, which is a climate controlled room, and that's where we keep all the good stuff. Um, but most, mostly the photos, we have about 10,000 photos here. And those are both Schmidt family photos and uh, brewery photos of construction of the, the various uh, brewery buildings. And we have oh, probably about 3,000 of those are snapshots of various brewery employees over the years. So if you have anybody, if you know of anybody who ever worked for the brewery, I bet I've got a photo of them downstairs. Probably know their birth date too. Maybe even their social security number. Um, uh, but over the year, well, starting about 1983, when the Schmitz sold their interest in the brewery, the new owners started to bring up material from uh, the, the plant over here, what we call the new brewery, the 1933 brewery. And they brought a lot of records over that they had no use for, and they literally dumped, and I do mean dumped, them in the basement. There was a, a pile, just a pile of boxes and loose material, uh, photos, uh, tax records, other all kinds of, of records from the brewery. And over the years, that has been added to as the brewery owners brought, cleaned out and brought over more things. The family would bring things. Other people, like you from the community, would bring things over once it was uh, known that we had a, a kind of a mini museum or archives going on here. And those things just grew and grew and grew. And also over the years, we had various people who were employed here or volunteered here to help sort out those things and make some kind of sense out of the mess. So at some point, probably back in the 90s or so, the archives looked like the photo on the left here, which was just a miscellaneous stack of overflowing, overstuffed boxes. But then gradually, they've uh, been getting more and more sorted. We had a gentleman who uh, worked for the state archives who worked here for several years on the weekends and got the boxes to the um, shape in the photo on the right where the boxes were at least organized and sorted by date and subject matter. And now we're, our job here is just part of that continuum and trying to carry on with fine tuning the collection and making it more uh, accessible so that hopefully one of these days we'll actually get some stuff online. So if you were interested in the Schmidt family or the brewery history, you can look it up online. You can certainly still come here and look through material. Um, will we ever get it all online? Yeah, I doubt it, but we at least will try to get the majority of the photos online and then also have um, finding aids where if you are interested in one particular subject that we could help you find material if you're interested in doing some research on your own or potentially writing or publishing an article. Um, one of the things we've been doing, <clears throat> and this is in conjunction with a consulting archivist we have who's a Dreed archivist, is moving things from acidic boxes and old acidic folders into acid-free folders that you see over on the right. Um, just try to clean them up and make sure that they last for a good long time. And then, we'll, as I said, we'll be scanning a lot of the more important documents and photos and getting those online. So as we go through these boxes, Believe me, there is at least one treasure and probably four or five stories in every box that we look into. It's just, it's so easy to get distracted here. 
Uh, so one of the stories, first one I'll start with, and then as Don said, we're going to tag team this back and forth, is a fish story. Picture it, 1939. There's a halibut that lives in the Pacific Ocean off the, the northwest coast here, and he decides that he wants to see the country. So before he leaves on his big expedition, he's, he doesn't know when he's going to next get a drink of his favorite beer, so he drinks a bottle before he leaves. Then he hitches a ride on a fishing boat. He gets picked up and gets taken to land and ends up in a refrigerated boxcar that heads east to New York and ends up in the Fulton Fish Market. Um, once he gets there, the fishmongers are surprised, very surprised, to find out that he's got the bottle of beer with him. It was in his stomach. <laughs> and this, uh, the whole thing was publicized a little bit by the uh, directors of the Fulton Fish Market, and they actually got into Ripley's, believe it or not. <laughs> so this is a little uh, cartoon, an actual cutout from a paper of the Ripley's uh, feature on our halibut. But there's a little bit more to the story. One of the directors of the Fulton Fish Market, the young guy on the right there, decided, well, this would make a good artifact to give to someone really connected with the story, Peter G. Schmidt, Sr., because the halibut was a very discerning halibut, and he only drank Oli. <laughs> and that was the beer bottle that he had with him when he ended up in New York. So uh, the director of the Fulton Fish Market packaged up that bottle and put it in a, a band of cotton so it was safe. He had a little uh, literature that went with it, and he actually presented it to Peter G. Schmidt in 1939 when Peter was in New York on a trip. Now, the stewardess uh, for United Airlines that is holding the halibut is not holding the halibut. He, he had gone on to his uh, heavenly reward or manifest destiny or whatever at someone's table. Um, so she's holding a substitute halibut. But the... Um, some of the literature that was put together, the Ripley's cartoon, and also the beer bottle itself, which still has halibut fish scales on it, is downstairs. So that's one of our little, little treasures. <laughs> I'll turn this over to Don. All right. It's, you can tell it's, it's a fun job to dig through all these files here and find all these discoveries. Uh, I've been over a little over a year on the job now as public history manager as of October. It was uh, one year then, so October, but a year and a quarter or something like that. And uh, I'd focused on older Tumwater history and, and took us up to statehood. And that's about the time the Schmitz arrived in 1896 and started the brewery. So I didn't know a lot of brewery stories except from people we knew that worked here and, and, and my parents' generation and so on. So I was anxious to learn more about this important part of Tumwater history, the, the brewery and the Schmidt family. And so one of the first things I discovered is that the Schmitz uh, uh, had nicknames that they gave to each other. A lot of nicknames. I mean, th that was what they went by, uh, was their nicknames. Let me, and we'll show you some of these here. But uh, everybody used nicknames for each other. They, they called each other by the nicknames, not by their real names. And so they, and, and people in town, the employees started to call them by their nicknames also. And so I was learning about those nicknames. Uh, some were, you know, very, very commonly used, but some were not so unusual. Nicknames like Connie and uh, Hank and Bobby, uh, Jenny, Rick and Alex, some of those kind of nicknames. But others were quite unique, and that's what we see here. Uh, we'll begin with Peter and Clara's offspring. They had four girls and one boy, and uh, Clara Louise was the oldest, and her nickname was Nucci. And so everybody, everybody knew her as Nucci. And her daughter, by the way, was, uh, who, whose real name was Louise, was Wheezy. So Nucci and Wheezy are here on the left. The next uh, sister in line was Marie. She was no known as Sis. And her daughter Candace was named Candy, nickname. Uh, Margaret, the next in line, was Grady. And then the last sister was Alice, and she was Udi. And we, have we, I've seen it spelled with two U's and two O's, so we're not quite sure if it's Udi or Udi, but we think it's Udi. And uh, we don't, you know, some of these names are interesting. In fact, uh, the last of that generation, Peter Jr., who passed away five weeks ago or six, something like that, uh, we got to quiz him about the nicknames. His, his nickname was Buzzy. In fact, I think I should, I think we're, there we are, there's Buzzy in his maybe 10, 15 years ago, I suppose. But uh, he was the only son of Peter, a senior, and Clara. 
But uh, we asked him how those nicknames came about, and he said, well, he thinks it's from baby talk. As, as, as kids are learning to talk, they don't know how to pronounce the name of the people, that they're, their family members, and so they'd use a, a, a name that was based upon what their first words were for somebody, <laughs> and so Nucci and so on. So uh, and, and that just became a Schmidt family tradition, was giving nicknames to each other. So we have a, a, a partial list here on the left, Bump, Bink, Skip, who was a former mayor of Tom Water, by the way, in fact, his real name was Philip. He was named for his Aunt Philippine. But he always went by Skip, and he said he, he didn't know his real name until he went to grade school. <laughs> he always went by Skip. And um, so uh, there was that. There was Fritz, and Kai, and Suey, and Spiff, and Fifi, and Muddy, or Moody. They even nicknamed things like their motorboat. Nooses was one of the mo motorboats. Their dog was Zippy, so everything had a nickname. Candy, Tyke, Dicky, Dusty. <laughs> so it's just a, a, a whole list of names, and it's been fun to, one of my first projects was discovering some of these nicknames of the Schmidt family. So there we go. As a, a little extra for that, if you take a house tour with Bob Krim, he'll probably tell you the story of when he first came to work here, one of his jobs was to, to deliver packages to different members of the family. And they would use things like bump and bink, and he had no idea who these people were. So he'd wander around for a long time before he actually figured out who they were. Um, well, let's see. You have all heard, I know, the slogan, it's the water. But how did that slogan come to be? Well, I want to tell you the rest of the story. In 1902, there was a young man working at the brewery by the name of Frank Kenny. And he decided that all the other breweries in the Northwest, well, and across the country, had some kind of a slogan, catchphrase for their beer. And he thought, by gum, that Oli Beer should have a slogan too. So he came up with one, it's the water. He knew it had to be short and punchy and memorable. If you got it too long, people wouldn't remember it. But he liked, it's the water. So one day he went to see Leopold Schmidt, the boss, and told him that we need to have a slogan. And here's, what, here's my idea, it's the water. And Leopold mulled it over for a little while, and he said, mm, well, I like the idea of a slogan, I guess, but maybe we should say, the water makes it good. And Frank said, no, that's too long. Well, how about the water makes it? Nope, nope, too long. And they went back and forth for the whole day, um, and Frank was just arguing his position. It's the water, got to be short, got to be punchy. And finally, at the end of the business day, Leopold says, well, it's time to go home. We'll pick this up tomorrow. So on the second day, Frank kept on arguing his position, and finally, 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 Leopold caved in and said, all right, all right, we'll adopt it, it's the water. And that's how the slogan came to be. But now, it, Frank went on to become a 50-year employee with the brewery. Uh, he was a smart young man, he, was, he started out as a bookkeeper, but over the years, as the Schmitz kept up with the brewery and then had many other entrepreneurial enterprises, uh, because they were not slackers, the Schmitz. They were always busy. Frank Kenny was always deeply involved with the other business enterprises, and Don will uh, talk more about that during the Prohibition years here in just a minute. But wh whatever the Schmitz started up, Frank was there in the thick of it. He was often an officer, president, uh, board member of many of the enterprises that they had, as you can see here on the list on the left. But he wasn't a, a slacker when it came to community affairs either. He was, uh, for several years, a member of the Olympia City Council. He was a member, a board member, and also an officer of the State Banking Association. He was a member of Veterans of Foreign Wars, the Elks Lodge, the Rotary, Cl Rotary International Club. He was very, very busy, very community-minded, and that's probably why he fit in so well with the Schmitz, because he was community-oriented. He also owned quite a, a goodly chunk of land out on Black Lake, and he eventually donated that to the local Girl Scout Council. Council, and that land is now a county park known as uh, Kennedale Park. So if you've ever been out on Black Lake and been to Kennedale Park, that's here because of Frank Kenny. So he was a tremendously valued employee of the Schmitz and also a, a, almost a member of the family. But now let me tell you the rest of the rest of the story. <laughs> Frank almost didn't make it here. He was married in 1899 back in Wisconsin, which is where he came from, where he worked for the Tui Mercantile Company, 
And after he'd been married for about a, a year or so, his wife said, why don't we take a vacation out to Olympia, Washington? I've got relatives out there and I'd like to visit them. So Frank uh, got permission from his boss, Edmund Tuohy, to take a vacation and he bought round trip tickets uh, out to Washington and back for he and his wife and they came out here to Olympia. And somewhere along the line in their trip, we don't know how, Frank met Leopold Schmidt and they apparently got on from the get-go like gangbusters, so much so that Leopold offered Frank a job at the brewery. He needed a, an a assistant bookkeeper and thought that Frank would be a good fit. And Frank said, well, I, I have no intention of, of moving out here. I'm just on a vacation from work. I need to go back to my existing job with Edmund Tuohy. And Leopold kept after him. He said, I'll offer you a good salary if you come to work for me. Well, Frank was torn, and he figured the only honorable thing to do was to send a telegram to his boss, Mr. Tui, let him know what the circumstances were that this guy out in Olympia had offered him a job and a better salary. But he said in his telegram, if you can match this salary, I'll come back to my, to my old job. Well, Frank sent the telegraph and waited for a reply, and he waited, and he waited. No reply was forthcoming, so he figured, okay, uh, this is fate. I guess we're staying here at Olympia, and I'll be working for the Olympia Brewing Company. Well, actually, it was Capital Brewing Company at that time, just before they changed their name. <clears throat> so that began Frank's 50-year employment history with the brewery, and all of the wonderful things he did for the Schmidt family, for the brewing enterprises, and for Thurston County in general. And now here's the rest of the rest of the rest of the story. <laughs> Some years after that, the Olympia Telegraph office building was being torn down. And as workers were cleaning out the building, they were moving the old furniture out, and they moved a heavy desk. And behind that desk were several telegrams that had never been delivered. They had fallen down behind the desk. You guessed it. One of those was from Edmund Tuohy. Not only did he meet Leopold's offer, but he bettered it by a goodly bit but that telegram was never delivered. <laughs> oh, these are great stories, aren't they? Yeah. And they're real, that's what makes them so good, too. Uh, the Noble Experiment, you know what that was? Prohibition? It was called the Noble Experiment. And uh, of course, the, the brewery and the Schmitz were going great guns. They were expanding like crazy. Their, the quality of their beer and their, their marketing and so on, uh, they were just growing, uh, became the largest employer in our area. And they were reaching markets like the Yukon for the Gold Rush people. They were hit, hitting the Sandwich Islands or Hawaii. Uh, they had markets in Shanghai, China, all along the coast, of course, and all over all along the Northern Pacific Railway right away. I mean, the Olympia beer was just really expanding quickly. And then, all of a sudden, it was shut down. <laughs> 1914, we, uh, we in this state had prohibition earlier than the nationwide prohibition. And all of a sudden, they couldn't do their livelihood. The successful brewery was shut down. They couldn't brew beer anymore. And so the Schmitz were, I, you'd say, well, well what, did, what did they do? How, how did they handle that? Uh, I would have been, you know, knocked for a loop and maybe given, given up or, you know, just whatever. But uh, they're not ones to give into despair. Uh, Karen hinted about that, how, how they would move on and, and do other ventures. And so the first thing they did was to um, start with, a, let's see, let me move this there. They, they, they uh, transformed the, uh, the, uh, the brew house, the old brewery, into manufacturing apple juice. They called it apple Jew. And there was another uh, facility that they had, uh, Loganberry juice also, and they were bottling that. In fact, they retooled the plant, spent more money than, uh, I think it was $60,000 of, of that money in those years uh, to retrofit that brewery and hired more people for that brewing, uh, uh, the, the juicing operation than they had for the brewery. So they went full, full bore on this. But it just, in fact, they had 500 tons of apples a day. They used uh, millions of gallons of juice. And so they've made a good show of it. But by 1920, uh, the sugar prices were fluctuating post-World War I. Uh, they just couldn't make a profit. So they finally gave up and uh, rented out the building or, or sold the building for another business. And so uh, Peter Jr., uh, or Senior, I'm, so, I'm sorry, Peter, our Peter here, uh, was what we would call a techie nowadays. He loved in investing or in inventing things, anything that had to do with uh, technology. And one of the things he did was um, work on, 
on uh, sh ships and, and especially uh, gasification from coal, uh, us usable fuel from coal. And we had the Bukota area coal mines. And so we thought that's, that's a, a good thing to pursue. So he invented these, uh, this gasification process and he built a, an engine from, uh, let's see, a 1909 patent that he had and uh, 300 horsepower engines that he put onto the ship, the Archer, and it was a schooner, and that made the San Francisco to DuPont run in 42 days, and there was eight round trips with those, those engines. And so it was a success, but the technology of diesel and oil were taking over, so it didn't last too long, but it shows some of his techiness, his uh, wanting to invent and, and be inventive and creative. But the, the Schmidt family continued with many, many ventures, and it wasn't just coal gasification. They got into Northwest fruit products. Uh, they had hotels. They had the Blass Oyster Company. They had a bookstore. The Schmitz had at least one bank. Olympia National Bank downtown was, was theirs. Uh, mining operations in Montana, where they were from before they got here, uh, involved in uh, Western metal craft that was located in the old brew house complex. Uh, the Schmidt Estate was an investment company, invested in a lot of different things. They had a uh, Northwest Transportation Company with trucks and buses on the old Pacific Highway. And they say the Greyhound is an offshoot of what they started back in those days. So everything they touched seemed to turn to gold, and, or at least uh, successful anyway, pretty much. But hotels was another thing they, they were into already. Uh, they had the Pacific Coast Investments, which were new hotels they built. And then they had Western Hotels, which was uh, managing older hotels for other owners and improving upon them and so on. So we, a list of their hotels is, well, quite extensive. I, we found the Governor Hotel in Olympia and also the Mitchell Hotel in Olympia across from Sylvester Park. They had a hotel in Deer Lodge, Montana, Boise, Idaho, the Multnomah in Oregon, uh, Mount Baker Lodge was one of theirs, uh, Lewis and Clark Hotel in Centralia. They had hotels in Seattle, Bellingham, Tacoma, Yakima, Aberdeen, and they say that the Western hotel chain of today is an offshoot of what they started with hotels back then. Uh, Peter also served on the Olympia Port Commission for 18 years, so he was a force behind the building of the Olympia Airport, which is Tumwater International now, to me. <laughs> I, call it, I call it that, it's still the Olympia Airport. But it's said that uh, United Airlines is somehow related to what they started with the airline industry, so uh, we can't confirm that yet, but that's, that's an intriguing idea. But eventually prohibition was lifted and the Olympia Brewing Company was reborn, and uh, the end of that era then was 1983 when Pabst bought out the Schmitz and that got sold to Miller, and then everything shut down in 2003. So anyway, th th they didn't let prohibition discourage them. OK. How many of you have been to any kind of a World's Fair? 1962 for me. Yeah. Well, the one in Spokane, too, whenever that was. 70, what was that, 74, 75, somewhere in there? OK. Well, I'm going to talk to you about the 1905 World's Fair. We're not old enough to remember that one. But the Schmitz were. Um, in 1905, the brewery was going full tilt, and the Schmitz were very interested in advertising their beer at any chance they got, and so they decided to have a display at the 1905 World's Fair, which was also known as the Lewis and Clark Centennial Exposition in Portland, Oregon. And their display down there, their exhibit, was going to be a recreation of a Swiss chalet. So they hired an architect in, by the interesting name of H. Hefty, to design a Swiss chalet that not only looked very much like a chalet from the outside, but on the inside had a water feature and a big panoramic painting so that visitors would walk inside the building and they would feel as if they were here at the foot of the Deschutes Falls. They could hear the water, they could smell the water, see the water, and with a lovely panoramic painting of the, the view down here with all the trees and the brewery. Um, so we still have these blueprints downstairs. There's a whole series of them. So that's how the, um, the Olympia Brewing Company display was designed for the 1905 World's Fair. And the chalet um, sat at one end of the fairgrounds, close to the water, appropriately enough. And after the fair was over, it lasted for several months in 1905, Leopold Schmidt thought, well, there's got to be a better use for that building rather than just tearing it down, as so many World's Fair buildings are. They're built rather cheaply and, then to, and last for the length of the fair, and then they're torn down. This one, Leopold thought, had a higher purpose in life. So he hired workers to dismantle it, and they brought it up to Olympia and reinstalled it, rebuilt it, and it sat in Priest Point Park 
for many, many years up until Drew, what, 1961 or so? Yeah, or in the early 1960s, when it was finally dismantled or burned, I'm not sure what happened to it. But it served as a community uh, center uh, there at Priest Point Park on the bluff overlooking the water. And it was uh, just a well-known spot for many, many years. You'll see, if you look on eBay or other places, you'll see lots of uh, uh, postcards that, that show that chalet. Another thing that came out of the World's Fair in 1905 was this document, which is a gold medal diploma for Olympia Brewing Company being awarded a gold medal for the best draft and bottled beer that was entered for competition in the fair. Now the story behind this is rather interesting. Not too long after I started working here, just a little over a year ago, I was going through the, some boxes in one of this, the side rooms downstairs, and these boxes were just cardboard boxes and labeled toss, question mark, throw out, question mark. And so I thought, well, I you know, better do my due diligence here and, and go through these boxes before I just blithely toss them on the heap. So I opened a box at a time, and in one box, there were a bunch of corporate records on the bottom. Actually, it was like a 1967 corporate report, and there were about 100 copies of the same report in there. Well, we didn't need those because we had some copies already in the archives. We try not to keep too many extras around. And then there was an old crumpled up grocery bag. And then there was another layer of some corporate documents on top. So I went through the first layer, got to the grocery bag, set that aside, and realized there wasn't anything terribly interesting in that box. And then I unfolded that grocery bag. <laughs> That's what it was. Uh, so that what I thought was just a regular craft paper brown bag was instead this document. I did a little research online, and I've only seen online three other diplomas like this, and they're all held either by a university or by a museum. So this was kind of a rare find, and I got that close to being chucked. <laughs> We're not going to show the movie necessarily on that. <laughs> we, I, I knew about Leopold Schmidt and Joanna, the founders of the brewery, but I didn't know about the lesser known younger brother, uh, Louis Schmidt. And so that's what this segment is. Louis Schmidt was the younger brother of Leopold. Uh, both of them were born in Germany, and they came to the States as young men. Uh, in fact, Louis was, I think, 14 years old when they made the trip across the ocean. And uh, Louis ended up in the Missouri Vineyards, working for some family members there and so on. And he ended up going with his brother to Montana in the gold fields. So his older brother, Leopold, was already, or they, they made the trip together, I think. Anyway, uh, they were, he took a job, a lot of odd jobs doing things in the Montana gold fields. He even took a job as a Pony Express rider with Wells Fargo. So he was a, an express rider for a while. And he worked for his brother in Butte for the uh, brewery that he started to build there in Butte, Montana, the Cent Centennial Brewing Company. And so they uh, worked there, and that's when they moved out to Tumwater after uh, that first trip in 1895. Uh, they moved, uh, Leopold loved this area of the, the Deschutes River falling into the salt water of the inlet here. And, and uh, then they found out about the artesian pure water and how good that was for brewing. And uh, compared to Butte, Montana, which was a mining city and polluted and ugly and didn't want to raise their kids there, they thought, well, we're going to sell our Centennial Brewing Company lock, stock, and barrel and move out to Tumwater and start over again. Beer barrel, there you go. <laughs> Lock, cask, and beer, I don't know, anyway. <laughs> anyway, they moved their families out here. It wasn't just Leopold and his family, but it was also younger brother Louis and his family. And in fact, uh, uh, they began in 1896 in the Centennial Brewing Company. And let me move this ahead a little bit here. Uh, Leopold headed the venture for building the brewery, but uh, Lewis built the first plant, physically built it and, and, and led the uh, crews that uh, cleaned out the land from what was before and then built the new wooden structure for Capital Brewing Company. And then he headed the bottling operation when they got started, so Lewis was very involved. In fact, Lewis was even became a mayor of Tumwater for a short time, for one little term in 1904. So he was here for nine years in Tumwater before he kind of gave up. He lost interest because he really brewing wasn't in his heart like it was for Leopold. He was a farmer. He liked farming. And so he uh, bowed out of the brewery and then moved to farm on Hope Island out in Puget Sound. And that's where you see this structure in the upper left corner. That's the farm on Hope Island that uh, Lewis uh, lived out his years pretty much. In fact, his descendant, 
Uh, Connie Sweetman has been volunteering in her archives this past year, and a lot of these photos are from her. In fact, she and her husband are in the back room there. But uh, so we learned a lot about Louis, the lesser known younger brother of Leopold. Uh, Louis died, her uncle Louis, I guess a lot of people call him that in the family, died at age 68. He was, uh, died in 1919 in Seattle. Uh, this picture you see of the brothers, that is on the right, uh, Leopold and Louis. Uh, in Loma Linda, California, I believe it was, just before Leopold had passed away, about 1914. And so that was the last known photo that we have of the two brothers together. So that is uh, Louis Schmidt. Okay, remember this title. It'll become important here in a minute. In, now, this is not a mug shot, but this is Peter, J, Peter G. Schmidt, Sr. Um, he looks pretty grim, but he didn't smile much. We have a lot of pictures of Peter, but not many of him smiling. And this is on his return from a long trip in which he had good reason not to smile. And we'll get to that in a minute. Um, in his younger days, well, I, actually, I guess throughout his life, Peter was prone to seasickness. Now, he had a small boat that he used to keep down here on the Sound. Uh, in fact, they had a little boathouse that was always uh, moored near the brewery. The boat was called Montana, and he apparently could pilot that boat either by rowing or by sail or even with a motor launch. And it, seasickness didn't bother him on that little boat. But his family often said of him that he would get seasick if he saw a ship tied up to the dock. So even though seasickness bothered him tremendously, he was entranced by flying. He loved planes, so much so that in the uh, early and mid-1930s when the Boeing plant up north was building their soon-to-be-famous Clipper series of uh, seaplanes, which we see here on the right. Peter Sr. took Peter Jr. on a trip up to Everett and they watched those planes being made. And Peter Sr. was just enthralled with the whole idea of flight. I think we have a copy of his pilot's license down, or some kind of a license downstairs too. Um, in 1939, the Pan American Airlines had just established the first commercial passenger flights across the Atlantic. That was a big deal. It was only, what, 12 years after Charlie Lindbergh's flight. Um, so here it is, 1939, and Peter is bound and determined to take a flight to Europe and see the old friends and family in Germany. And you know what else was on the horizon in 1939? World, worldwide, uh, that, speaking that way. Um, so Peter tried to get on the very first commercial flight, and I think it was in June of 1939, and he missed it. It was already filled up. But he had a friend at Boeing, and he talked to this friend, and the friend secured a seat for him on the second flight. So this is the Dixie Clipper. This is the actual plane that Peter flew on in 1939, in July, uh, from New York to Europe. And he first had to get from Seattle to New York. So I'm making a slight assumption here. He must have told his wife, Clara, that he was going on an extended business trip to New York. She, she had to have known that much. And that was not unusual for him. He was a big wig and he would have had occasion to go to the East Coast before in business. So as far as Clara knew, he was flying from Seattle to New York and then he'd be there for a few weeks on business. What Clara didn't know was that he was then continuing on on this second only flight across the Atlantic Ocean to Europe. So can you see that there might be some trouble on the horizon here? Um, downstairs we have quite a few mementos from Peter's trip across the pond, as it were. Uh, in the middle there you see the, uh, the big red line uh, about through the middle of the map that shows New York, uh, and then there is a stop for fuel at the Azores Island and then islands and then they the flight continued on to Lisbon, Portugal And that's the flight that Peter took uh, here We have a baggage claim check for his actual baggage that was checked through on this flight and This was an exclusive flight. This was not for uh, you know, there are no cheap seats on this flight This is all first class. They even had a printed menu for one of their meals. They had roast Long Island duckling with uh, the various accoutrements. <laughs> and on the way, um, the passenger list was so small that it was actually printed on a nice sheet of cardstock and given along with a complete crew list to every passenger. There are only 17 passengers on the flight and you can see here that down about eight or so is uh, Peter's name. Um, 
On the top right, you see a postcard that Peter brought back with him, and that shows uh, the Marine Terminal in New York, which is where his flight took off from, and when he returned from Europe, he also landed at that same Marine Terminal in New York City, in, at LaGuardia. Um, and here you see the notes that he personally put on his little passenger list to remind himself of who he met on the flight. And as I said, this, the, no cheap seats here, and so all these people were fairly important people. Um, on the bottom left, you see Bishop Shile, I believe is how you pronounce his name. <coughs> Excuse me. And he was already a bishop in the Archdiocese of Chicago, and he, after he returned from this uh, vacation, he would shortly become the Auxiliary Archbishop of Chicago, so an important guy. Next, to, in the middle there, you see a guy by the name of Fred Emerson, who Peter had noted on, noted on the top as an energetic shoe manufacturer. I thought, well, that's kind of a nice description of him. As it turns out, he manufactured a brand of shoe known as Energetic. <laughs> so kind of like Life Stride or Converse or whatever. Well, his, his shoe name was Energetic. <clears throat> he may have been Energetic himself. I'm not sure. And possibly the most interesting person on the flight was the guy on the right here who was from Peru. He was a writer, a poet, a statesman, and his name was Luis Aleza. And he and Peter got to know each other a little bit on the flight. Luis later wrote a book about that flight and about his subsequent time in Europe called Clipper and War. And he mentions a German brewer that he made friends with on the flight. He never mentions Peter by name, but there aren't any other German brewers on that list. Um, so that, uh, let me, oops, let me back up here. There we go. So at, somewhere along the line on his flight to Europe, Peter, or once he got there, Peter uh, telegraphed back to his brother here and said, by the way, I'm in Europe. I didn't tell you and I didn't tell Clara because I didn't want to worry you. Um, so I'm not sure how or when Clara got the word that her husband was in Europe, but she did. And when Peter came back, <clears throat> even though he got back here in August, you know, in, in midsummer, as it were, probably the weather was pretty warm, but his son Buzzy told, told us that after Peter returned to the house, this very house, the climate here was mm. chilly for a long <laughs> time. <laughs> Oh, this is fun. This is very fun. Um, this was a discovery I made, not necessarily in our archives, but I was able to relate it to the Schmidt family a little bit. I stumbled upon an old newspaper article uh, from the Morning Olympian, dated September 4th, 1910, and it intrigued me since it dealt with the modern advancements of, uh, of time and how Tumwater began to adjust uh, to make the transition from the horse and buggy into the era of the horseless carriage, or the benzene buggy, the automobiles. And it seems uh, the increase in early cars and trucks on the main street of Tumwater, which is now Deschutes Parkway by the Falls Terrace, that was the main highway, uh, it was causing a lot of problems with dust. Uh, it was wafting up through the air during the dry weather, coating all the businesses and residences and making it hard to breathe. Uh, the business people near the Boston Street Bridge, which at that time was called the Custer Way Bridge, the same one that's by the Falls Terrace now, uh, they were, they needed to do something, and they, Charles Hewitt, the druggist, uh, Thomas Ismay, Frank Cook, the grocery man, uh, C.F. Eastman, they all took it upon themselves to oil the streets for about a block area in that, in the spring of one year, and, and many people were objecting, objecting to that because of the smell and the, and the oily appearance, it didn't look nice, but they, they needed to do something about that dust. And the Tumwater men said it worked as well here as it did down in California where thousands of miles of county roads were oiled. And so once they oiled their street, the dust was gone and it was cost savings also because the price of oil was offset by the savings in road work. Uh, the oiled surface saved the crowning of the road surface and greatly reduced uh, the ruts that's caused by traffic. And so it was starting to head towards the idea of pavement. And uh, this uh, picture here on the upper right is my uh, grandpa's brother, Nate Trosper, had the Olympic Auto Camp. It was a pre pre precursor to uh, motels and hotels along the highway. And it was a bunch of cabins that he rented out for the people traveling the old highway. It's located where, across the street from where Southgate now is, where Trosper Road comes into uh, uh, Capitol Boulevard. 
and uh, I think there's a bank and then the Plaza Jalisco and all these places are there. So that's where the Olympic Auto Camp was and you can see the old time vehicles and the, and the Aristo motor oil and the, and the general repairs and, and so there was just, uh, uh, automobiles were taking over and it was kind of interesting. So uh, it, and it relates to the Schmitz also and it's, uh, I found that a, a brief quote in that article that said, for, quote, Adolf Schmidt also oiled the street in front of his residence with good results, unquote. <laughs> so that's how I had tied it into the Schmidt family. He liked that. Anyway. <laughs> so anyway, it was a, it was a fun discovery. And I, I couldn't resist this picture of the kid with his little toy automobile, his own little benzene buggy. <laughs> so I had to include that in the photos. So that is pretty much what we have coming attractions. We have, of course, you've got our uh, history talks, you're used to that now. Uh, river walk tours in the summer, we do guided river walk tours and, and you're sure welcome to come to that July through September. And our guided house tours with Bob Krim here are, are great. Uh, you'll want to come and hear all the stories about the Schmidt family, especially Peter and Clara and all the kids and, and all the jobs that uh, Bob has done over the years. You can read our blog at our, at our, on our website, oletumfoundation.org. And, you'll, and you click on the thing that says blog and you'll see all kinds of articles and, and pictures and things like that. And also you'll scroll down far enough and you'll find my talking over old times little video features that have gone over so well the first 10 episodes that we've already worked with TCTV and are in the production stage of another 10 episodes. And so we'll have 20 of those little three minute blurbs on Tumwater history. And it's just great fun. So I, I'm gonna go ahead and open it up to um, question and answer. We still have a few minutes left here if you want to talk, ask a question of Karen or me or the two of us, whatever. Let's start over here and then we'll go that way. Karen, uh, the story about the telegram, did, I don't remember his name now, but the tell for whom it was intended, did he ever know that the telegram arrived and he never received it? You're only supposed to ask questions that I know the answers uh. to. <laughs> And I don't know the answer to that one. But there is some hint that some members of the Tui family, I don't think it was Edmund Tui, but they actually made their way out to Washington State too. Right? And that's, I don't know. So, sorry. <laughs> and somebody had a question over here. There were stories about how a ghost was sighted for about 10 years after Mrs. Schmidt died. That's, we should bring Bob. That's Bob. Hey, Bob. Yo, Bob. Come here. Come here. Come on. You're going to tell your ghost story. You might as well hear it from the source. He had first-hand experience with the ghost near the house. And he tells this story during his house tour, so uh, we're giving you a preview of one of his house tours. Really. And so you just want to stand right over here and we can... What am I doing? Tell me the ghost story. Oh, the ghost story. Oh, uh, <laughs> Clara, when I took care of her, um, when she passed away upstairs, I used to go up and I used to go to the house upstairs and do stuff for her upstairs. And then when she passed away, uh, when I used to come into the house every morning, I used to walk up the stairs and in the stairway that I used to pass her, which is a ghost, which is kind of like in the movies. I mean, you kind of see it's a pink, pink nightgown she was wearing and uh, in the hallway there. And so I used to go up there every morning and check the house and everything. And every morning I would see her coming through the, the hallway there. And that went on for about 10 years. After 10 years, it just stopped and I never seen her any more than that. But she was always on the left-hand side when I went up and I could put my hand through her and stuff like that. But uh, she always just looked straight ahead and uh, that was a love story. <laughs> well, everybody thought I was drinking and stuff like that. But, uh, but I have proof that I had, uh, uh, I had uh, some women come over here from the brewery to clean the house. One woman came over here and she cleaned the house and she wouldn't come back because she'd seen the ghost. So then they had two women from the brewery come over here and she said, well, they'd seen the ghost. So they wouldn't come back. So then they had three women. Finally, they had to have four women come over here before they stay here and clean the house. <clears throat> so, yeah. <laughs> but and then I had weddings and stuff in the house, so I have a lot of proof that I wasn't drunk. <laughs> Yeah, I always tell everybody I pay her for that. <laughs>
<laughs> okay, and some, another question back here. The, the, old, the, the old brewery, the brick building, was that here, was, was that built before the Schmitz or did they build that building? Okay, if you didn't hear his question, he's asking, was the old brewery built before the Schmitz? No, the Schmitz built that. So Leopold started that, Leopold and Lewis actually built that, the, for the complex in 1896. And then the brick tower that we think of as being so iconic here in town was built in 1906. So, uh, so they owned it all straight through Prohibition. Yep. Anything else? Yep. Any idea how much the fair was across the Atlantic when you went when it cost <laughs> I haven't researched that yet, but that's a good question. I'll have to find out. But I'm sure it wasn't cheap, you know, because those were not not everyday people in the business class that were taking those flights. So I'm sure it must have been spendy even in those days. I, but that's a good question. I'll, I'll look that up. Oh, well, maybe. Um, before, and I don't know what year that was, yeah. be, so 37 or so? When was the Hindenburg crash? Was that 36, was it? Okay. Peter, this guy right here, Peter was slated to go on the Hindenburg. Yeah. Not that exact flight. He actually had a ticket to go on that flight after, the flight immediately at the return flight. Um, and the, the Hindenburg, as we all know, exploded and, and burned. And Peter got, downstairs we have a letter kind of read, well, I guess giving Peter his money back because there was no Hindenburg to take. So he, he came again pretty close to, to losing it there. Yep. More questions up Well, everything I've heard so far has been very positive. Or, or when things were bad, they toughed out through it and got through it and everything. I wonder, was there anything ever Okay, he's he's after the dirt here. <laughs> he wants to, if you didn't hear him, he he wanted to know was there anything ever criminal that happened in the family or the brewery. Um, Don actually has found several newspaper articles of murders and whatnot, associated not with the Schmitz, but associated with brewery employees. There are a lot of brewery employees, so something was bound to happen. Um, the Schmitz were not always wealthy when they started up the, the brewery again in 1933 after Prohibition was repealed. They were going door to door selling stock certificates at a buck a piece. So they, even though they were very busy and had money of their own, they did not have enough to just willy nilly start up a whole new brewery with their own money, so they sold stocks. Um, they did have, well, let's see, can I tell this story? Uh, I guess so. Um, <laughs> One of Peter's brothers was an alcoholic, and he caused all kinds of problems, and he was known as the black sheep of the family, and he was, um, he got into trouble all the time. He'd start drinking, and he was, if I'm not stating this too strongly, boy, this is going to go out on TV, and some Schmidt yeah. descendant is going to get mad at me. Oh, that's okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, but he got to be kind of a scam artist, and he would tell people that he was in charge of things here, and he had all kinds of money behind him. And then he'd, he'd go straight for a while, and then he'd relapse, and he actually lived off of his daughter for a while. And he, we have many letters downstairs where his daughter is writing to Uncle Peter asking for help. And it seems like the family, well, as you can imagine, a lot of families have people like this uh, in our midst. They helped him out, and then they'd get sick of it, and they never really got to the point of tough love, I don't think. Uh, but they bailed him out many and many a time. So that's the only sh uh, Schmidt ne'er do well that I can think of at the moment. Back then, so. I got a hand over here. Yeah, I had a question about uh, we always hear about uh, hopefully that the old uh, tower, the brew house, was going to be refurbished. Mm. Oh, that, that, it seems like those stories come and go. And <laughs> yeah, in fact, we have um, <laughs> the drawings for what they have planned for that. George Heidgerken owns the, the brew house complex down there. And he has uh, in the environmental impact statement phase of that planning and what he wants to do with not only the brew house but the whole complex and even a parking garage along the bank here and that kind of thing. So it's uh, going to take millions of dollars to actually make that come to fruition. But it's before the city council now, the, the environmental impact statement phase is 
concluding, and so now the city council decides which version they may want to approve of the, of the options that he's presented to them. And so if and when that gets approved, then it'll, I suppose it'll go to permit building permit phases and, and looking for the investors to actually start to make it happen. But we, I don't know, it's hard to say with the expense that it's going to be to the access down to that plant is very narrow driveway. And, and so that's why the parking garage idea and then just, uh, and of course, environment with the river and, and the wetlands and things. Uh, we'll see. But I'm, I, I personally am skeptical, but hopeful. I would love to see that happen. And, that, and the city is talking about perhaps having George donate the, the brick part, the tower, back to the city and maybe uh, use that as a tourism kind of uh, draw, perhaps. We'll see how, how that all goes. It's all up in the air right now. We do have a buyer of the modern brewery now. Uh, the uh, group out of California has just a few weeks ago purchased that. And he's a hotelier, I mean, like he's a well-known worldwide hotel guy. And so maybe that will be something that'll raise up in there. I, we don't know yet. We don't know what, is, what their plans are. Trump.